I will now call, call to order the May 9th meeting of the Traffic Review Advisory Board. Good afternoon and welcome. The Traffic Review Advisory Board reviews items of interest regarding parking and traffic within the city of Oshkosh. We are an advisory board and our favorable recommendations today will go before the Oshkosh Common Council. The council can accept or reject any recommendation from this board. If the board does not recommend an item and you don't agree with our decision, you may discuss the item with any common council member and the council member may sponsor a new ordinance regarding the item. All items recommended by this board require two readings before the common council. The first reading will take place on Tuesday, May 23rd at 6 p.m. and you will be allowed to comment on the item at that time so the council will take no action. On Tuesday, May, on Tuesday, June 13th at 6 p.m., the item will be on a second reading at which, which time the council will take action. You will again be allowed to speak to the item. For this, afternoon, this afternoon's meeting, I will read each item, each agenda item, at which time if you would like to speak, please step up to the podium and give your name and address. I do ask that you keep your comments pertinent to the agenda item to which you are speaking. The item will then come back to the board for discussion and action. Uh, uh, approval of minutes. Does anybody which wish to uh, Make a motion. Call the roll first, or? Um, I said, sure, let me mm -hmm. call the roll. I'll call the okay. roll first. Uh, Becker. Absent. Christensen. Uh, just a, a question. I was not here at that, the meeting that we're approving the minutes of. Um, I mean, I can, I can vote yes. But I, it's just a question, you know, it's just a kind of a, uh, you know, I, I'm not familiar with what, I, I know what the agenda was, but I don't. Um, yeah, we probably, we probably should table the, well, you can do the um, attendance, but then we should probably table the minutes because then we won't have a quorum. Yeah, for right. Okay. Uh, Christensen is here. Oz? Here. 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 Move to table the vote on the approval of minutes. Okay. We have a second. Second. Yes. And I'll call the roll. Christensen? Aye. Oz? Aye. 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 Okay, the next item is public comment. The board has adopted a public participation policy which provides 15 minutes for general public comment on a first come, first served basis. Citizens much must provide their name and address and may speak on matters related to traffic issues within the authority of the board. Statements should be addressed to the board members and not to staff or other persons. Items that are on the agenda should be addressed at the time the item is read and not during the public, not during the period of public comments. Statements are limited to three minutes and citizens may only provide comments one time unless special permission is granted by the board. Any, does anybody wish to uh, comment? Okay, no one. Uh, new business, first item, a request to remove the two hour parking restriction on 17th Avenue, north side from 56 feet east of Oregon Street to 110 feet east of Oregon Street between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Currently, the current condition 
is uh, tour parking on the north side from 20 feet east of Oregon Street to 110 feet east of Oregon Street between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Okay, um, I don't see that resident here, but this is a request from the resident that lives um, at this house here. Um, and what he's requesting to be able to, to park vehicles in, in front of his house. Um, I, I did, I researched um, this and um, this building on the corner, um, it looks like it was changed from 15 minute to two hour parking in 2008. Um, it was 15 minute parking when this was a pizza delivery place. And then it was more recently a beauty salon and that's when it was changed to two hour. Um, it's now vacant. Um, so. I guess I don't really see any reason why we couldn't allow him to park, you know, he'd be able to park one car, you know, depending how big it is possibly to probably just one though in front of his house. And then um, that would still leave, you know, enough room for depending how, again, how big they are for at least a vehicle here. Um, and then, you know, we don't know what uh, the use of this building will be. It's been vacant for, for a while now from what I understand. So but parking a vehicle here doesn't there's really no concern with that as far as i'm concerned it, it's far enough away from the intersection and this whoever that occupies this building will still have some room to park here there's no parking in oregon in that section there is away from the corner you can't park at the corner but you like where uh -huh. okay. a little further down there is a little bit of parking available like basically where this car is that car is parked there <laughs> and then there's some parking also on the other side of the street i, I know people that go to witsky's park over here so it seems to be the ordinance is you know, outdated at this point. Any uh, board members wish to comment? No. Otherwise, a motion? Move it. Second. Yeah, aye. 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 Uh, the next item is review of bike lane enforcement. Um, at the last couple of meetings, you'd asked for, um, and, and I know that uh, Ben had asked, and he's not on the board anymore, but um, for um, some of the officers to come in to speak about the uh, bike lane enforcement. So we got the representative from UWO's PD here and then as well as the Oshkosh Police Department. Um, so I guess I'll leave it up to you what, what questions you had regarding the, um, the bike lanes. Main issue I have with the bike lanes, I guess, is like by like uh, the one-way streets, by like high. You got people using the bike lane in the proper way. Then you got people coming at you in the traffic lane, you know, straight ahead towards you. Right. Yeah. Um, during, well, any time of day, that is a problem. One of the problems we have trying to, when we, when we have the ability to, we stop those people that are going the wrong way. Try to educate them, and if it's a first-time offense, we'll warn them for it. If it's a continuous behavior, then you set date, you know, give citations for going the wrong way. Bikes have to follow the same rules as as automobiles when it comes to rules of the road. Um, going the wrong way on the one way, for instance, in the bike lanes is a violation. Um, one of the issues we have a lot of times is trying to actually catch up to that person. Um, during the daytime with the amount of foot traffic and other traffic, it's difficult sometimes to try to swing back around to cut that person off and to talk to them. That's a lot of times when we get around, they're gone. They're either already into an academic building 
or a truck through campus someplace, or a lot of times they even made it beyond where we thought we could catch up to them. Um, so that's one of the difficulties we have sometimes trying to enforce the, the bike lane rules and stuff on the campus on Algoma and I have. Um, I, I work six at night to four in the morning. Sometimes it's a little easier for somebody during my shift to to catch those people because there's less traffic, less foot traffic. Um, on, but for the daytime, um, I know I, I worked I worked days um, a couple of years ago for a short period of time, and just the volume of, of foot traffic alone really it makes it hard to try to catch those people. Um, cause you, there's so many people crossing, coming and going, but we we do our best to try to, to try to enforce that. Uh, when we're talking to people, we actually have um, kind of little cheat sheets for, for them on some of the rules of the road. We also, one thing we've implemented in the last year around the university is um, kind of um, our version of Titan tokens. Titan tokens are given to students that are seen doing good things. For us, it's uh, pedestrians using the crosswalks bicyclists go on the correct way, um, simple things like that. We hand out these little little uh, token chips and um, if they collect a couple of those, they can come by the police department and redeem them for t-shirts and things like that. So we're trying to, you know, put that incentive towards things like that to try to get the students to follow the rules and do, do the things that they're supposed to. Um, so, I mean, it, it's definitely something that we try to enforce whenever possible. Um, unfortunately, like I said, sometimes during the daytime, it's hard to try to catch up to those people to try to enforce it. Um. And, I, that, and I think what you guys were looking for is just, you know, that, um, and, and it sounds like you're trying to educate the, the bicyclists just so they know, yeah. you know, it's... Yeah, I, and I can, I can speak for pretty much all of our officers when it comes to dealing with things like this. You know, if we stop somebody and warn them the first time and we happen to stop them again, um, it's kind of common, common practice to ask our dispatchers if we've had contact with that person before and what it was for. You know, if it's the same thing reoccurring, like I said, you know, unfortunately our education process is not working and generally they'll give a citation then after that. <clears throat> Could a sign of some sort be designed for bikes only, wrong way? Uh, that would have to be up to your street department because all those streets going through campus are governed by the city as far as signage and everything. Um, so that would really have to, I guess, would be up to the city if they wanted well, to. Well, yeah. Well, that, I was just wondering if it would get too confusing to the motor vehicle driver, even though they're facing the other way. Yeah, um, I don't know, maybe even something as simple as putting a, a bike with the circle and the line yeah, to it right. on the opposite end, of, on the opposite side, so if they're going to advance traffic, they see right. that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget the bike lanes are signed with a bike, it right. an arrow in the direction that you're supposed to ride, so right. they're clearly yeah. being ignored anyways. Well, I don't know. One way street signs, the wrong way, and all we still get drivers going yeah, sure. the wrong way, so it doesn't help everything, yeah. but it, it's bound to help some. And I think that what you guys are talking about the main issue is probably it, it's high in Algoma, you know, because yeah. college kids that it's not all over probably don't, Interesting. don't care or not pay attention. Especially oh, sure. when we can't catch up to them, <laughs> even talk to them about it. You know, I I can't tell you how many times I don't have enough fingers and toes to come up how many times I tried to catch somebody and by the time I got around they're either way past me or they're in a building someplace. I have no clue where they went to. So Yeah. And I know initially when we first talked about it, you know, like from the O P D standpoint, they're like, Well, you know, we'll address it as, as we can, but it's you know, like you said, it's hard to 
it's hard to catch a person doing that. But then, you know, and the goal is mainly to educate them. So right. I, I would assume from OPD is probably the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's bike month. We have a bike officer working right now on shift. Um, it's something that we pass along to everybody to say, hey, look, there's an issue that was brought to our attention. I see most of it when I'm coming to work. I work the afternoon shift, 2 30 to 10 30. And most of the time, I see the kids violating when I'm coming in, and I can't stop them if I'm not on duty or not working in my own personal vehicle. But it is frustrating. It is, you know, like you just mentioned, if you have two people going against traffic, somebody has to go one way or the other. So I think the biggest thing is education, letting people know that you can't do this. And we all understand that sometimes going from building to building, especially in the university area, the quickest way for a student might just be to quit go against traffic, cut across the street, and get where they need to go versus going all the way around. Um, they are able to ride on the sidewalk, but um, I think the biggest thing is stopping people and letting people know, maybe with kids, send out some social media alerts uh, to let everybody know as a reminder that this is what you can and can't do. One of, one of the problems we face, too, is, you know, with, for our department, we're a small department because of the area that we're in, and, uh, you know, like my shift, Right now, I'm the only person working, will be working from 6 till 10 o'clock. And then um, even daytimes, a lot of times we only have one officer during the daytime that's working. Um, I mean, we've got other people that are there, but they're they're tied up with their meetings and everything throughout the day. Um, so trying to, try to actually focus on that is hard sometimes when you're, when you got calls for service. Maybe signage would help, at least help you out. Anything further on that? Yeah, I guess the only other thing I could bring up is uh, signage like um, on uh, Sawyer and Witzel and Taft at Sawyer is like bike lane goes to the intersection, but um, like this, a lot of times cars are trying to get into that right lane, which it should be strictly for the bikes, you know, so like I've had times where like, you know, somebody's like, cutting me off or something by they're going around you on the right if you can maybe have like all the signs are like you have like a left arrow or and like a straight arrow if you could like add in like a bike you know like a third lane for the bike in there or something I, so people realize it's not a driving lane i don't know if that'd be possible yeah i don't know it's it's interesting um yeah i can certainly look into it but the uh you know like it, it they are, you know, they're signed as bike lanes, but I think, well, now they've been around a couple of years. I mean, they were new a few years ago, so people didn't even know what they were or what they were for. I think now um, people realize that. I mean, we, we've actually changed how we paint, too, because we used to paint solid lines all the way up to the intersection, but then we kind of noticed that people weren't really sure if they could, like, turn then, you know, so that's why we put the dotted lines, you know, towards intersections so they know, you know, where it's dotted, then you know you're taught you can go over a dotted line, but not a solid line. So we've we've done that. We've kind of took that from some other communities, but um, yeah, that still does happen on occasion, though, where you get drivers that don't understand that. Or, you know. Yeah, like I've had it where then I've got a car. I'm trying to make a right turn, and then I got a car, you know, along to the right of me, you know, so right. you know, kind of you know holds everything up. Sure. So that's something too, you know, like. Um, I know it's bike safety month and there's uh, May 20th they're having that the bike Oshkosh event and um, I know the bike and pedestrian committee is trying to educate people as well on um, the different bike laws and I think it's getting better as people are more familiar with the bike lanes as more of them get implemented but that that's something too that we have to continue to watch. Yeah, you need not only do the bicyclists need to be educated but the right. car drivers as well. Okay, uh, next item, review annual 2016 crash report. All right, well thanks. Thank you guys for coming. Welcome to stick around or you can, if you gotta go, you can go as well. Um, all right. So I had sent out this, uh, the report that um, did a little bit earlier this year, so the, but I pulled this data from the uh, Wisconsin DOT website, so the data is usually, you know, is as up to date as that website is. 
Um, but I thought instead of reading this whole thing, I'll just kind of give you a summary of what I've uh, what I learned this year. Um, it looks, you know, from our uh, the total number of accidents, we're up a little bit from 2015, but um, they're you know historically about where they have been. So well, well, it went up a little bit. I mean, it's still. It looks like historically, it's it's staying around the same range. Um, then a couple. Then I look at um, the number of injuries and fatalities. And again, in 2016, the number of injuries went up a little bit. But um, and I'll mention that again when we talk about roundabouts. But you can tell roundabouts were introduced in Oshkosh in 2011. So you can see that since roundabouts, the number of injuries has decreased significantly, um, which, is, which is a good sign. Um, the number of accidents with bike and pedestrians, um, with bicyclists, it's come down a little bit, but stayed pretty consistent. Um, with pedestrians, it went up a little bit this year, um, back to more historical levels. Um, so there's a couple trends there we can uh, Keep an eye on. I mean, we have done a number of things over the last couple of years to help with uh, pedestrian safety, which most of you are familiar with. Um, we've invested pretty heavily in those the RFBs, rectangular rapidly flashing beacons. We have them now in one, two, three, uh, four, five locations. Um, and then we also, as you're aware, have implemented the overhead LED pedestrian crossing signs um, in a couple locations, like like Jackson, New York, for instance, which. Um, should bring more awareness um, to some of those higher volume pedestrian crossings and then UWO we have that hawk signal so um, we're continuing to look at that and as we have funding available we try to look at upgrading the higher volume crossings and the ones where there's there's more incidents um, so then after that I look at the high crash locations and as you can see um, Generally, the, the intersections with roundabouts are the higher crash totals, but that, that should be expected because those are also the highest volume intersections in the city. So those kind of go hand in hand. Um, the majority of them have greatly decreased. Uh... Yeah, they have. That's the other um, interesting phenomenon with the roundabouts is that um, Initially, the accidents went up when they were implemented, but now they've started to come down because people have gotten more familiar with them. Um, so that's a good sign. That it's kind of what uh, you know we expected when the roundabouts were implemented, and that's what um, historically they've shown to do in other areas. Which brings me to the roundabouts. Um, like I said, they're they started about 2011, and those are the busiest intersections in the city so a highest higher amount of traffic usually correlates with a higher number of, of, of crashes um, initially it was due to drivers not being as familiar um, but now they're starting to to come down back to more normal levels and actually um, starting to level off um, something we had looked at historically and this started probably uh, six seven years ago as well as the accidents with injuries at roundabouts um, and as you can see that those have uh, come down as well, um, which is an expectation of roundabouts because you have less um, angled accidents. Um, you don't have that severe angle like you do at a normal intersection. So the number of injuries per crash um, has come down at almost every intersection since they were implemented. So that's, those are good signs that roundabouts are, are doing what they were intended to do. And the severity of injuries has also went down since the roundabout's been implemented. So then historically what we've done is we've looked at um, the intersections, you know, from each type of traffic control. So we start with roundabouts, then we look at uh, traffic signals. And we're looking at, generally we look at a five-year period and we look at um, a, a crash rate. Um, and that can be used to predict how many crashes we expect at an intersection with similar traffic volume and geometric design. And then we look at the frequency, um, and that can sometimes indicate areas where you might be able to make some type of geometric improvements or do something to improve the safety of the intersection. Um, so then I kind of, you know, to narrow it down, then I looked at some specific intersections, um, the ones that had at least four crashes, and then based on the crash ratio, um, the ones that were the highest. And what I do is you compare it to um, 
the DOT has a statistic they use for what a typical intersection. You know, it's based on a lot of things like how many legs of the intersection, how much the traffic volume is, and you come up with, you know, what would an expected crash rate be at a normal intersection. So we look at some of those things and then um, analyze some of the higher crash locations. Uh, but some of the highlights that I, I just wanted to point out, you can obviously read through the report, but Murdoch in Wisconsin, um, since we implemented that roundabout, it is doing what we had hoped it would do. Um, we were down to only two crashes at that intersection um, in 2016, which was the first full year that that was in place. So you can see, you know, we went up nine to high of 13 and we're down to two, so we'll have to keep an eye on that and hopefully that trend continues. Um, but that's a good sign there. And I'll just highlight a couple other ones of, that you might be interested in. Um, so I, I looked into these, one, these in more detail. Um, Bowen and Murdoch, um, two of the five crashes there were where the lights were in flash mode. That's something else this board's talked about over the years is we're, we're trying to <laughs> limit the number of intersections that are in flash. Um, and in order to do that, we have to actuate the, the signals and so we can accommodate for pedestrians. So this intersection is actually getting uh, reconstructed this summer. So when we do that, we'll be able to actuate the intersection, put in pedestrian push buttons, so then we can eliminate the flash there, which will hopefully help the, the safety there. Um, so here in Witzel, that's something we, with that one we have to keep an eye on. Um, you know, it's just, it's just a high volume intersection. Um, you know, initially there was some additional volume there due to some of the, the roundabout constructions, but uh, we, we need to keep an eye on that one. I know we did the, we did a version of a road diet there when we put the bike lanes in, and that's helped a little bit for the um, north and south traffic on Sawyer, but there's still some issues with east and west on Witzel. And like most intersections, the number one cause of crashes that I see every year is when you're turning left and you can't see the curb lane because there's an opposing vehicle turning left. And that's what showed in this, this incident as well. So that's, you know, we've talked about the negative and the zero and the positive offsets. And that's whenever we can, we're trying to get those intersections, the left turns to be zero offsets. So the vehicles are facing each other. So you only have to cross one lane. Um, Highway 44 in Washburn, that's, it's under DOT jurisdiction, but that's more related to the, all the events out there and people being distracted um, usually leads to a higher number of incidents out there. Um, and that was the common thread there was the inattentive driving and rear end crashes being the most frequent incidents. Um, Jackson and New York, again, the, the majority of accidents there were result of the left turning vehicles. Um, I'm actually, I'm talking with the DOT about the potential for having a left turn a left turn arrow or something like that there. Um, I've, they've done some preliminary research on it, so I'll hopefully can report back to you <laughs> maybe next month on that um, to see what we've discovered. Um, West Haven and Witzels went up a little bit. That's a very busy intersection as well. Um, however, that was one that used to be in flash and we just um, put in late last year the pedestrian button, so now that one's not in flash anymore either. So hopefully that'll have an effect on some of those um, crashes going down. Um, Jackson and Pearl, most of the accidents there were, were people running red signals, so th that's, that's human behavior. That's not as much as a, um, an engineering um, cause. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I just quickly on all the always stop controlled intersections. You know, I looked at a couple there. Uh, the division in Pearl. Um, the, most of the crashes at at these um, intersections, it's the same in Harrison and Murdoch. It's drivers failing to yield, so they get to the intersection, and then it's kind of they think they got there before the other vehicle, and the other vehicle thinks they got there first, and they both um, end up, and then they end up running into each other. So. That too is more of a driver behavior issue. Um, then I looked at a few of the stop controlled intersections. Um, West Haven and West Town. Again, it was vehicles not yielding the right away, one of the rear end. Um, 
Kentucky and Mur Murdoch, that's been on the radar for a couple of years, and that's one we'll have to keep an eye on as well. There wasn't really a common thread there. I mean, it's a busy coming out of the, you know, out of the, yeah, the, um, the Fairview Stop Acres it. there. Yeah. Yeah. That, and then also sometimes there's an, e there's an issue with vehicles trying to cross four lanes of traffic there as well. You're and, trying to get another business opening up there too now. Right. Yep, the credit union's starting there. Yep. Cause bigger, more problems. Yeah, we actually, that one I was involved with the site plan review, so we, we only allowed them one intersection on Murdoch, and we tried to move it further away. So we'll see how that goes. It's going to be better than it was before when the restaurant was there. Um, Sawyer and Taft, they were all vehicles from Taft that didn't yield the right away at the stop sign. So those are just some of the highlights you can read through the report. Um, there weren't really any yield controlled intersections that were noteworthy that investigated further review. Um, so that's kind of what I had to report. I don't know if you have any questions on it. Or. Oh, I was going to bring up the arrow system, and you kind of answered that then on, on Whistle and uh, uh, Sawyer. Uh, there's been a lot more arrow usage in the last few years, is there any, hopefully, good, positive research back? Or does it help more to have arrows or not? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I I haven't done any research myself, but I know that's, that is why the DOT is implementing those. So like um, any intersection the DOT reconstructs, they're putting in that the, le the flashing left turn arrow, which um, we talked about a few years ago educating motors to what that means um, and it they have found that it does have an impact so whenever they redo an intersection they generally implement that and then they also implement um, they call them the mono tubes so the great big poles with the big arm that goes across every lane so when they do that they're, they're putting a signal head per lane because um, they found that that's helpful too so you can see the signal head in whichever lane you're in um, so when they, they did those on the intersections on Highway 44, so they did it on like South Park and Washburn, for instance, um, and now we have the same thing at New York um, and Maine. So whenever they can, they're putting those in. It's a little, it's more, little more difficult for us to do because we have such tight right away in, in the city with all <coughs> the intersections we have. So there's not a lot of places where we have the ability to put in the, the monotubes and put the the structure over although um, there are some cases where maybe we could look at doing something like that we would just have to add another head to the arm of the, the drivers center. are getting used to that and uh, easily educated from what's been done in the last few years yep yep so that definitely is the trend Absolutely. I wanted to bring up on ninth and Kohler both from a delay standpoint and a safety issue you get, uh, if you're going uh, north on Kohler, when you get to the roundabout at 9th, there's a left turn lane and a straight right, and the straight right backs way up, you know, considerably, you know, past like the Pizza Hut even. Mm -hmm. And the, the left, you only have like, you know, you know, no delay at all, you know, like one or two cars at most. And then, so what some people are doing, they're jumping out of the straight right lane going into that left turn lane, but they're not turning left, they're going straight through, which causes a safety issue with people going, you know, right to, uh, nor from right from 9th onto North Kohler. And uh, another safety issue is too, is people are driving through the parking lots from like Staples, uh, Pizza Hut, you know, et cetera, you know, the Little Caesars and Walgreens yeah. to avoid the traffic, you know. So that you got many more conflict points in the parking lot you know, drivers coming out of a park park space or, you know, pedestrians, you know, so like you're creating that, tr you know, people are avoiding, like I said, the, the traffic jam on Kohler to go through that parking lot. So like I said, you got several safety issues caused by the traffic backup. I don't know if you could, what you could do is either add the straight arrow, make it a left straight and a right straight, or, or but like I said, there's a vast discrepancy, but like I said, that that straight right lane backs way up, and like I said, there's no backup whatsoever on the left turn lane. 
Yeah, I think that has to do, well, I don't know if you could do that with the roundabout design, you know, because that's part of the roundabout design. I was wondering if they're, like, on Ninth and Washburn, you got, like, an additional right turn lane there by the Burger King. I don't know if there's enough property by Walgreens to carve an additional lane in at all. Or... Yeah, I don't know. That's that's something I can um, I can ask the DOT if... Well, like I said, I, I drive through that intersection daily, and, uh, you, you know, if I'm patronizing one of those businesses in that parking lot shopping center right. area I always do go through the Walgreens because that's the way I'm going I'm not gonna you know go back onto the street and wait for 10 minutes when I can just drive through yeah yeah I can I'll ask but I'm pretty sure that that's probably what the issue was you know on Washburn where they had enough right away to do that and I know what you're talking about I mean I've drive there all the time so I know what you're talking about but it's I don't know that if there's a solution to that but I'll I, I'll ask them if they have any opinion on that. Another thing is like uh, when you're turning towards the Red Robin there, you know, there's like no hash mark to divide into two lanes. So uh, part of the reason is the people that are going, make, driving straight through the left turn lane, they're just driving like into that, right? You know, instead of like if they were coming, if you had two lanes, they would like maybe, you know, probably stay to the left, but otherwise there's, it's just like one big lane, then they just kind of like drive into the people. Yeah, that's something I, I can definitely look into that. And... Yeah, you'd only need like, you know, probably one hash mark, maybe two at the most. You know? Sure. Yeah, that's something we could talk about. I don't know if you've ever any traffic counts or anything have ever been done there. Or, or like I said, if it, I didn't know if it was the state jurisdiction or what. But. Yeah, it, well, it's a city jurisdiction, but the state, we, we built those roundabouts <laughs> when they did Highway 41. I mean, striping, we can definitely do the um, traffic counts we have. I mean, they're they're really high by the roundabout. I mean, they just actually, the state just redid the traffic counts last summer. So. I was like wondering what the difference between the people that are going straight or, or right or the difference between the people right. that are going left. Yeah, they haven't done that. Um, like I said, there's, there's a huge discrepancy, you know, like I said, you know, it's be like from here to Church Street. Or like I said, no cars at all. Right. You know? and, it, and that is, you know, and that's a good point. It is difficult to, well, it's difficult at, with traditional traffic counting measures to count that. So even at a traditional intersection, you know, if we use the road tubes to do counts, we can, it's hard to do turning movements. So like um, we have we, we have used some camera software that, and it'll, it does a bunch of, algorithms and figures out you know vehicles that are turning left and um, and we have done that in the past but roundabouts are pretty unique it that is there is some newer software out there that can do that but it's yeah that's a good that is more difficult to calculate you could probably do the tube one like just at the before the vehicles enter the roundabout because you would know if the people are in that left turn lane right you know or the other lane yeah yeah that is something that like i said i just see it as like a potential big safety issue, you know, you don't want to see like some pedestrian getting hit in the parking lot or, you know, where a, the car would ne normally have driven on the street. Or... Yeah. So, I mean, generally there's, um, you know, in, in traffic, there's the, the three or forties, I guess you could say. So there's the education, there's um, engineering, um, and then there's enforcement. So I do know that one of the things with roundabouts, and Kelly can probably speak to that, is I know that the police department is, um, you might have seen that they got a couple Harleys, so they're going to be using those for some roundabout education enforcement. Well, we, we've got a Kelly. motorcycle unit. The officers oh. finish their training tomorrow, so we're going to deploy starting on Thursday, and they're going to be specifically targeting the roundabouts and the, the five high-crash intersections. And we've been deploying uh, grant officers. We have uh, through um, state, um, I can't remember the name of the grant. We have a, basically it's a seatbelt grant through the state. We've been focusing our efforts at um, uh, Jackson and New York on the north side and on uh, Ninth and Polar on the south side of the roundabouts because of the high crash volume that we have there. So we are trying to step up enforcement both through the grant deployments and also through the motor unit. So, so that should be helpful for some education and you know enforcement like um, yeah and like you mentioned that ninth and Kohler that's obviously very busy and it does 
it backs up and people get impatient. Well, especially like, you know, like it's general for like a lot of people, they're in the lane that's way backed up and then there's like no cars in the other lane whatsoever. People are always, you know, it's like when there's a lane blocked on the freeway, people always yeah. drive ahead to the... <laughs> yeah, I know, I actually, yeah. I, I go west most of the time because that's where I, I live west. So it's always kind of a relief if I can get in that left lane because it's usually, it's not blocked as mm -hmm. bad as the right one. And I'm like, oh, I'll be okay. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I'll, um, I'm actually going to be talking with uh, one of the DOT's engineers about a couple things, so I'll ask them to get their opinion on this. I think it's the only roundabout where you have like a separate, you know, left lane where like most of them are, like, so you can go straight through any of the lanes. Like, so it's just, you know, human nature that people are going to get out of that, you know, lane that's backed up and go into the lane with no cars, whether they're supposed to just go left or not. They're, a lot of them are going to go straight. Any other uh, board comments on this? Do you have anything else on this? What's that? Anything else on this? No. Okay. Um, staff statements. Um, then I was just wanted to inform you that, uh, and I, I think I might have mentioned this before, but we're planning a, a new signal at the intersection of 11th and Main Street. Um, and that's kind of to prepare for the <clears throat> arena there. Um, their main entrances to the parking lot are going to be off of uh, South Park, which we already have a signalized intersection, and then off of 11th. Um, so while it, it won't meet the warrants at all times, but it will obviously during arena events. So um, we thought it was best to, to get that in there now, especially um, you know when events release. It's, you know, short of having an officer out there all the time, which, you know, initially they might still have to have some um, type of traffic control, but at least having a signal there will help the traffic flow um, when the events start and end. Um, so we're working on the, the design for that, um, as well as um, some, some of the street lighting and upgrading the traffic signals at South Park and Main as part of the uh, arena project. Any, any further word as to when the actual opening of the arena is? Yeah, well, they're supposed to, their first game's going to be in November, so they have to be open by then. I guess they're doing their best. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, um, as far as the um, construction work on Main Street in that area, they're looking to bid that out um, pretty soon, so that'll, probably be taking place towards uh, the end of summer. Okay, does anybody have a agenda item for the next meeting? Move to adjourn. Okay. Second. <laughs> Roll call. Christensen. Aye. Paz. Aye. 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 Aye.